We'll try it again. Good morning. All right. So we are in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. Real quick, though, not a, we won't do a show of hands. We won't make you out yourself. But uh, have you ever struggled with depression or discouragement? Does this, uh, does this describe you, right? You're, you're tired. <laughs> Maybe you've uh, been feeling like a failure. Maybe even struggling with your faith. Maybe you feel like nobody appreciates your work or how hard you work. You had a friend that uh, betrayed you or showed maybe they weren't the friend you thought they were. Seems like all you see or hear are negative things. This is 2020, so that applies to everybody, I think. But um, You just want to be alone. Maybe you Maybe you even feel like dying, right? Reality is, almost everyone has felt those things, right? And, it, and if you're feeling those things, you're in good company because we've all had some of that. And one thing that we, we see in the Word of God is that even the best of men are only men at best, right? We all go through stuff, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, before we do, though, let's go ahead and we'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us understand this stuff. Jesus, we thank you so much for uh, blessing us with the health to be able to leave our homes and gather together like this, and sing songs of praise and fellowship together. Lord, we also thank you that uh, you've blessed us to live in a time where there's technology available that um, people who maybe can't uh, leave their homes can still hear your word spoken and taught. Uh, these are strange times, but um, nothing catches you by surprise. We know that. We just pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us, open the eyes of our hearts today to see the truth of who you are and who we can be in you. Well, we pray for your blessing on the hearts of your people on this message. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So last week, Ben uh, took us through 1 Kings chapter 18. And there were a lot of things that happened in there. We saw Elijah, he had a showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal, and, and God sent down fire, and uh, Baal was nowhere to be found. Apparently he was in the bathroom, we learned. Um, you have to listen to that message to get that joke. But, but the people recognized that Yahweh was the true God. Right? There was this crazy sequence of events. And then Elijah had all the prophets of Baal put to death, um, he uh, told King Ahab that the drought was coming to an end. And Ahab took off for Jezreel in his, his chariot, and Elijah headed the same way on foot and somehow miraculously beat him there and you know, ran 20-plus miles to Jezreel, uh, which shows he's nothing like me. I, am, I will run 20-plus miles for nothing. I'm tired after I mow my yard. So, uh, so that's a full day, to say the least, right? He... Uh, he took on a false god, he had some people executed, outran a chariot. Um, Elijah is a bad guy killing, miracle working, super powered, marathon running stud of a prophet. Right? That's his, I mean, he is as flashy and powerful as any prophet in all of scripture. However, even the best of men are only men at best. And so one of the things I appreciate about the Bible is the fact that uh, the Bible does not pull any punches. Uh, it's a very balanced book for all the highlight reels and miracles that we see. Uh, the Bible is more than anything about speaking the truth, and it, and it speaks the truth about these men and shows their failings as well, warts and all. Uh, and so we're... We're, chapter 19, we're going to get into, after this miraculous sequence of events, we're going to see that Elijah is a worn out, discouraged guy. Right? He's, he's depressed. So we'll, we'll get into it. First Kings 19, verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he, he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life as, 
of one of them by tomorrow about this time. He was afraid and arose and ran for his life. So after everything that happened in chapter 18, still the queen's words scared him enough that after running 20 miles, he got up and ran again. No Epsom salt soak or anything. I mean, he says he ran for his life. Now, if you read commentaries and stuff, you, almost every commentator will point out, see, Elijah's faith has failed. His fear is bigger than his faith. And, and there's some truth to that, right? He is thinking more about what he's afraid of rather than what he believes in. He's, he's worried more about the mountain than the mountain mover right now. But to be fair, this isn't an idle threat. This isn't like when, you know, someone who's too easy on their kids says, you know, now, I'm going to count to three. One, two, two and a half. Right? This isn't that. This is, she has done this. She has killed prophets. There's no reason to believe that she wouldn't do it. And so that's something to keep in mind, is that discouragement can have very valid reasons. There can be real things that cause it. You know, our, our health declines or job goes away or business is down, someone you love made a bad decision, maybe you made a bad decision, you lost somebody. Those are real circumstances can be involved in seasons like this. There's also an element that maybe we, we overlook is there's emotional and physical exhaustion. Right? All those, those miraculous mountaintop experiences like we saw in chapter 18, can be draining. And also, he literally ran 20 miles, right? He's physically depleted. He's emotionally exhausted. Farmers can feel like this after the harvest season, right? They work so hard to get through this project, and it's done, and not only are they physically drained, but they're kind of emotionally spent, and there's this letdown period. Maybe you felt like that after a big project at work or home project or whatever. You can be emotionally and physically exhausted. So those are real, real factors. But ultimately, it's true. God's, or Elijah's fear has, has gotten into the driver's seat rather than his faith. We'll read on. Verse 3 again. It says, He was afraid and arose and ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. I'd say that's pretty discouraged. But there's something interesting there that we kind of read right past, right? He came to Beersheba. Beersheba is this place that Abraham, back in Genesis, what is it, 21 and 26, Abraham had dug wells there. We know there was good, clean, fresh water at Beersheba. And Elijah has brought his servant, a man who worships God and, you know, is faithful. He brought him to Beersheba, and then he leaves him behind and also leaves the place where there is good drinking water, and he goes out into the desert, into the wilderness alone, where there is no water and there's no, there's no people, there's no fellowship. And it just makes me wonder, how often do we do that, right? Some trials, some difficulties come into our life, and instead of fellowshipping with other believers, what we're doing right now, and drinking in the word of God, we leave both of those behind, wander off into the desert alone. It's the worst thing for us. See, the natural causes are real, but natural causes are rarely treated well by doing what comes natural, right? Our natural inclination is to run away from what is best for us. I, I use this illustration all the time, but it's why when I'm hungry, I want Jim's pizza, not a kale salad. Jim's pizza is, it's, uh, I think it's righteous, but it's, but it's still probably not good for you health-wise, right? What, I, what, what comes naturally is to want what is not good for us. And so he leaves behind what is best for him. We're so tempted to do that, to abandon what we need most when we need it most. In Hebrews 10, we quote this verse quite a bit around here, but 
Verse 25, it says, Not forsaking our own assembling together. That's what we're doing right now. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We, we need to be together to encourage one another. It's not just to get together and learn. That, that's great. But the biggest thing is to be alongside that other servant of God. So you, he can encourage you and you can encourage him. So Elijah, he's isolated himself and he just wants to die. Now, most people will not admit to having that thought or that emotion. Although studies show that most people have had those thoughts at some point. They just want it to be over. Moses felt this way. So did Jonah. So did Jeremiah. So did David. And there are more. But these are some of the greatest names in the Bible. And they got to some of the worst places in their lives. Because even the best of men are only men at best. First Kings 19, verse 5, it says, He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise, eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and lay down again. Now, I've been uh, preaching for two decades, and I spent a good portion of my time preaching the Old Testament, majored in that when I was studying it in school and stuff, so this, this is my jam, right? And after 20 plus years of studying this stuff, I started preaching when I was like five or six, by the way, so. But I've, I've uh, after deep, intense research, I've discovered what the angel actually gave him here it was angel food cake. That's so dumb, but I, <laughs> how do I recover from that? Okay, verse 7 says, uh, the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. And there's a lot in that sentence. Arise, eat. Because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So God sends an angel to feed and sustain Elijah, but he doesn't have much to say. He just says, between this mountain and the next mountain, in this valley, you can't do this on your own strength. It is too much for you. Have a bite to eat. He lets him rest. He says, you need a vacation. Between those mountaintop experiences, you need the bread of life to sustain you. But eventually, Elijah, he makes his way to Mount Horeb. Now, we know this mountain by another name, Mount Sinai. Does that sound more familiar? This is the place where Moses saw the burning bush. This is the place where Moses received the law and the commandments, right? And so maybe Elijah's going there because he feels like, well, maybe I can, you know, get my mojo back. I can experience God better there or something. I'm, we're not quite sure, but he heads that way. Verse 9, it says, Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now notice, God doesn't immediately tell Elijah what to do. He doesn't scold him for how he feels. He's not like, shame on you, Elijah. After all I've done, you act like this. He doesn't do that. What he does is he asks questions, and he listens. That sounds like counseling, doesn't it? Isn't that what happens in counseling? A good counselor asks questions and listens. One of the unfortunate realities in the modern church is we have this view of mental health that it's always just a failing of faith. You feel this way or you think this way because you're just not reading and praying enough. You don't have enough faith. And, but no one would 
venture to say that Elijah didn't have faith, right? They, they call him, he's like the superman of prophets. We want to jump right into fixing people, right? If there's someone in your life that's going through a season like this, what we want to do is just quote some scripture at them, say, you know, just count it all joy, you know, pick yourself up and get back in the game. But that's not how God handled it. God asked questions, and he listened. So he started by feeding him and comforting him and listening to him. It makes me wonder sometimes, you know, we take meals to people after they have a baby or after they have a surgery. Uh, you ever take a meal to someone who you think is depressed or just struggling? We don't really do that. Verse 10, it says, He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, when you're discouraged, you start to see everything in the negative, even to the point of exaggeration. If you're married, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? When you're upset with your spouse, before long, everything they do gets on your nerves. They breathe too loud. Right? You ever been in that spot? Don't, don't raise your hand. But, right? You, you start to see everything as negative. And so, Elijah, he says, Israel has forsaken your covenant. Now, that was true, but that's begun to change. Right? He's not even seeing some of the positives. Because last week, Ben covered in chapter 18, verse 39, it says, when all the people saw it when they saw how God intervened and everything. It says they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Right? So there's been positive change, but he's not seeing that. And then he says, I alone am left. In chapter 18, verse 4, it says, when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. So not only is he not the only one left. There's at least a hundred, right? It's depression and discouragement. It clouds our thinking, and it, and it distorts the truth. And that's where the devil loves to sneak in and, and whisper sweet discouragements and lies into our ears. So be careful how harshly you're judging somebody else, because you may not be actually thinking all that clearly, right? You may not be seeing things in the light of truth. Now God, he has this three-part recipe or prescription for discouragement. So first there was rest, right? He didn't, didn't scold him, didn't give him anything to do other than, you know what? Just rest here. Eat. And, you know, you take a little time. And then he moves on to the second step, which is to remember. He reminds Elijah of who he is, of who God is, and how to hear his voice. We'll read on here, verse 11. It says, So he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... A sound of gentle blowing. Or in the King James, it's a still, small voice. Literally, this translates as, in the sound of thinnest silence. Was where he could be heard. You know, when we're depressed or struggling, what we tend to do is we look for big events, big things to change how we feel. Big experiences. That's what we look to for hope. So if I go on this trip, right, if I go to this concert, uh, if I change jobs, if I tie one on, get a good buzz, something to make me feel different, that's what will make me feel better. You know, at Mount Carmel, the, the, with the prophets of Baal and all that, that was a huge thing. That was a huge experience. 
But at Mount Horeb, God says, That's, you don't need lots of noise and big experiences. You need to get alone and quiet with me. And learn to hear my soft voice deep within your soul, deep in your heart. You need to be quiet and listen more than you need another experience. Verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Same question. Elijah gives him the same answer. Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So God basically says, okay, Elijah, what's, tell me again, what's got you so down? All right, so we've, that recipe for dealing with discouragement, we've got rest, we've got remember, and now, step three, is God helps Elijah refocus. We need to change how you're seeing things. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the uh, wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Heziel, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he gives Elijah some purpose and some motivation. He says, look, I've still got work for you to do. You're going to go anoint some kings. But also... You're going you're gonna to appoint a successor for your ministry, right? Because you're not just going to leave me hanging, right? You're going to mentor somebody. Oh, and by the way, Mr. I alone am left. I have 7,000 of you ready to go. Not just one, not just 100. And all of that, I think, is just in those first two words, right? Go, return. Now, I understand that some very real things may have happened to you lately. Or maybe it's been a long season that you've been in where you may need some rest and you've wandered off in the wilderness a little bit, even burnt some bridges along the way. But now it's, it's time to get out of your cave because God has a purpose and an intention for your life. He says, go return because... I'm not done, so neither are you. You're still here, so I have a purpose for you. I think there's a lot, a lot in there, too, you know, that uh, he doesn't tell him to go do a bunch of miraculous stuff. He goes, I just want you to get back to work, one foot in front of the other, and you're going to pour into a few people. Because one of the things that happens when we're in this type of season is we become self-obsessed. Now, you may not think of it that way, but if you're depressed, probably all you can think about is your depression. All you can think about is how bad you feel, or how bad you want it to be over, or whatever the case may be. But Jesus says, no, think of others ahead of yourself, right? He doesn't, he doesn't mean ignore your problems, but part of how you heal is by helping other people. It's, it's counterintuitive, but it's the truth. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on here. Verse 19, it says, So he departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him. Uh, and, he, uh, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. <laughs> that cracks me up. It, it doesn't say like he did this cool, fancy, ceremonial thing. He was just like, eh, here's my mantle. I guess you're my assistant now. He's, he's not still super thrilled to be doing the work, but he's doing it. It says here that Elisha, I know it's confusing, Elijah and Elisha. Um, 
But it says here, Elisha, he had 12 yoke of oxen. That's, that means he was from a wealthy family. Right? He, this was a lot. In verse 20, it says, He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. So, you may be familiar, there's a story in the New Testament where uh, Jesus encounters someone and wants them to come follow, and he handles that situation very differently. There's some reasons for that. I think Pastor Chris is going to touch on this next week. Well, suffice to say that what what Elisha did is he went back, and he he didn't sacrifice all the oxen. He sacrificed his share of the family fortune basically said, I'm done with the farming business, I'm now in the prophesying business, right? But you catch that last little line, it says, he arose and followed Elijah and did what? Ministered to him. Somehow, this guy that Elijah is supposed to be pouring energy into is ministering to him, right? There's healing in pouring into other people. And we're going to learn a lot more about Elisha later. I, not only is Elijah not done in ministry, but, you know, he's, he's got a whole new chapter to it. And Elisha arguably has, I think, a bigger impact, a bigger ministry than Elijah does. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. But, you know, if you're depressed or you're discouraged, it, it doesn't mean that your faith is deficient. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean that there are real natural causes, but we can't always fix it by doing what comes naturally. But you may need to do some of the, the natural things, some of the, the real physical things. Right? You may need to rest. You may, you may need to learn to how, how to eat and sleep right. Because you're probably not doing both, either one of those very well right now. And it's, it's time to get alone with God, but see, here's, here's the trick. That's not the same as isolating yourself, which is what Elijah tried to do. It's not the same as withdrawing from people. You may just need to not be so entertained and have some quiet time with God. You might find yourself in this cycle of stinking thinking, is what we like to call it, you know, where all I can see is the negative stuff. Paul tells us in the New Testament that we're to take our thought life captive and that we're to dwell on whatever is pure and lovely and, most importantly, true, right? What is true, what I can do, not what I can't, what I do know, not what I don't, because anxiety is all about not knowing things, right? It's getting our our thought life under control and and dwelling on the right things. Here's here's the biggest worry I have for for you if you're in this this season is is you may be tempted to walk away from things, to walk away from your job or your marriage or your church or your, your friends or your faith. Troubled people make troubling decisions, right? You know, if this is you, you know you are not in your best place right now. Why would you trust your decision making (laughs) right now? Troubled people make troubling decisions. So it's not time to quit, but it is time to to refocus. And God gave Elijah a new focus for his work and his ministry and his life, so we're not done with him. But I want to go back. I mentioned, you know, there were other people in the scripture that, had, that struggled with these same issues, and one of them is Jeremiah. I want to just look at a couple verses of what he went through. In Jeremiah 15, verse 10, it says, Then I said, What sorrow is mine, my mother? Oh, that I had died at birth. I am hated everywhere I go. I'm neither a lender who threatens to foreclose nor a borrower 
who refuses to pay, yet they all curse me. Jeremiah, he just feels like everybody hates him, and he just wishes he was dead. He's miserable. There's a few verses of back and forth, and we'll, we're going to skip down to verse 19. It says, this is how the Lord responds. If you return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. I'm going to stop there for a second. Jeremiah has not just ran off and quit serving God. Jeremiah hasn't said, you know what, I don't believe any of this, and I'm done, and, you know, he's not at the depths of depravity or anything. He's still God's prophet during this time. He's still serving God, but he, he must be kind of going through the motions. But God says, if you return to me, even though I'm right here, we're distant, if you return to me, I will restore you. So, so what? So you can continue to serve me. Because what did the angel say earlier? This journey is too hard for you. You need, you need, my, you need my food. We'll read on. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones, you will be my spokesman. You must influence them. Do not let them influence you. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones, what were the worthless words he was saying? He was like, everybody hates me. I just wish I was dead. I'm miserable. Uh, he's just pointing out all the negatives in his situation. He says, those are worthless words. You need to speak what is true. Because your life is not something that just happens to you. It's not just a series of unfortunate events that all just fell on you. That's how we can feel sometimes, right? I'm just, you know, there's luck in the world, and I got all the bad, and somebody else got all the good, and it's not fair, and that's just how it is. No, your life is a series of decisions and consequences, but also a lot of it is how you're seeing it and knowing what is true versus believing the lie. Here is what is true. You are, from God's word, you are loved. You matter. You've been bought with a price. You're a child of the king. You're not the sum total of your sin and your shame. How all the things that you're beating yourself up over, that is not how God sees you. He knew every bit of it when he chose to send his son to die on a cross for you. Jesus was fully aware of every mistake you would ever make. He was fully aware of everything wrong that you would do that you feel shame over. And he said, I still love that one enough that I am willing to die for them so that they can live. That is what is true. In John 10, verse 10, I'm going to read this from the message. Jesus says, a thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Jesus didn't just come so you can be with him in heaven. That's great. But he also wants you to have a better life here than what you can even imagine. It doesn't mean be healthy, wealthy, and wise. It means he, he wants you to have a fuller, better life here than what you can have apart from him. So, what was our little three-part recipe? It was rest, remember, refocus. Rest, you need to get a little time and quiet with his word. Remember what is true, not the lie. And refocus. You're still here. That means he's got something for you to do. Who are you pouring into? Because they're going to pour back into you, right? Elijah starts mentoring Elisha, and Elisha immediately starts ministering to Elijah. Rest, remember, refocus. If you do that, you're going to start seeing things a little differently. If you rest, and you remember, and you refocus, you're going to find you have a little more energy, a little more pep in your step, a little more life left in you than what maybe you thought. And more than anything, remember that even 
the best of men are only men at best. You're going through some stuff. It happens. Rest. Remember. Refocus. Get back out there. All right, let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, in your word you made sure to, to show us that uh, people haven't changed all that much. We still struggle with the same things that people in Moses' time and Elijah's time and David's time struggled with. If there's anyone here that's not struggling with those things, we're thankful for that. We pray you continue to bless them and, and make them a light to, to others. For those that are struggling, Lord, we just pray that uh, they would be able to slow down get quiet and hear your voice they would remember who they are and who they can be in you and, and that they could refocus that you could give them new purpose new zeal some things probably need to change some things probably need to go but we know that you still have a plan for them. It maybe just looks a little different, but God, help us to see how it is we can serve others and serve you. Help us to not just get through life, but to live it fully in the light of the truth of your word. Lord, we pray for your blessing on the hearts of your people on this church, our community. And we pray you come and come quickly. And all God's people said, amen. All right, ready? Break. <laughs>